that's good. So I just want to introduce uh, Sebastian. Sebastian is a cloud engineer at the AGI Foundation. He's playing a pivotal role to approach the community. And he has a, 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 a kind of background in computer science. He's at the moment in at Malaga. Uh, if you are not wrong, and you've been as well having many activities in the UK studies, but maybe you can tell more about you later. But uh, welcome, Sebastian, to this session. Feel free to share your screen, and yeah, we start. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm trying to share my screen. Okay, now I think I, sh I should. Good. Okay. Right, so uh, I am Sebastian, and I I work at EGI Foundation as a cloud community support specialist. Um, and then today I'm going to present uh, the, this this uh, talk about uh, discussing what EGI is and and what we do. Um, also, the connection between EGI and the European Open Science Cloud. And, and then how the contribution to the reproducibility challenge came to be. So um, without further ado, um, I'm going to present uh, EGI now, who we are and what we do. Uh, so some of you may be familiar with the, with CERN and the Large Hadron Collider. And when the, this was designed and built uh, in the late 90s. Uh, they realized that the amount of data pumped out by um, the detectors was so big that it was uh, impossible for the computing infrastructure at CERN to uh, store and process all the data. So they established an international collaboration where uh, and other data centers from around the world could collaborate and work together, uh, basically to offer uh, computing power and also data storage. And the idea was quite successful. So then the question came, how can we then can we then apply this to other disciplines as well? Uh, and with that idea in mind, uh, in 2010, EGI Foundation was established. And now in 2023, uh, EGI is supporting more than uh, 250 communities uh, with this idea of uh, international collaboration um, uh, around Europe and, and around the world. Um, so a bit of uh, terminology here. Uh, EGI Foundation is at the bottom, and uh, this is a non-for-profit legal entity based in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, and it is the coordination, the coordinating body for for the EGI Federation. So the federation uh, consists of uh, infrastructure providers, service providers, technology providers, uh, all working together to serve a community of users. Uh, so what? We say we are the EA Foundation, but together with the providers, we are the federation, and together with the user, we are all the EA community. That that's what uh, we used to name ourselves. And the vision is that all researchers should have seamless access to services, resources, and expertise to collaborate and conduct work as uh, research and innovation. And then the, we separate the mission of the foundation and the federation. The federation delivers open solutions for advanced computing and data analytics in research and innovation, and then the foundation enables the federation uh, to be used by international research. Uh, um, and then on, on, on the map, you see uh, the members of the EGI Council uh, and the location. And the EGI Council is the highest body uh, that mandates the activities for, for EGI. So they, they say the direction that we need to go um, uh, in the future. Um, and anybody can join. Uh, here is the link uh, to, to, to get more information about it. So there we are. We, I'm going to show the baseline infrastructure, thanks to the EA Federation. So on the, on the left side, you see HTC on the top and HPC at the bottom. HTC was the federation used for the LHC. That's why you see it's, it's big, it's, it's enormous, and it's around the world. Um, then on the bottom uh, left, you see the H High Performance Computing uh, Federation, which is a new idea that started last year. That's why it's so small and we are it's, it's in, be in beta and we are doing uh, work on it. Uh, on the right side on the top, you see the cloud sites around Europe that are part of the federation. And it's been around for uh, almost a decade now. So it's, it's, in, it's in a good shape. 
And the recent addition as well is uh, a data federation based on the one data technology. So this, this is all offering compute and data around, around the globe, around the infrastructure. So what EGI does is to put, to, to put in place services in what we call internal services that basically brings together the, infra the capacity uh, from across all the providers and present that to the users. Uh, so in there, you see a registry for the services. We have a, a database where all uh, providers are registered and all the service end endpoints are registered. We have a, a monitoring dashboard to monitor the health of the systems across the federation, accounting to account for the usage, a health desk. Uh, you, you go to a health desk and then you, so you can submit a ticket to any of the sites. Uh, so together, the infrastructure with the internal services it what it what we provide to the scientific community so they can come to the um, to the federation and build on top of it uh, platforms and community services, uh, be it uh, virtual research environments, scientific gateways, etc. That that's the idea. Uh, and then we have just discussed the internal services to put the providers together, but then we the, this is the, the portfolio of external services. Uh, so in the compute category, we have cloud compute, cloud container compute, high throughput and high performance compute. Uh, in the compute orchestration, we have workload manager and infrastructure manager. Workload manager is, is, is a system that enables you to submit HTC jobs to more than one HTC cluster in the federation. And infrastructure manager is a system that allows you to deploy virtual uh, infrastructure on top of more than one cloud site. And this is what we'll discuss later, a little bit uh, later on. Um, I say beta because those are new services being introdu introduced in the catalog and, and they need to mature a little bit more. Uh, in the storage and data, we have data hub, um, which is the, this uh, system to federate data um, providers. We have a, a data transfer server and online storage. And uh, in the security and identity, we have EGI check-in. This is a, basically an authentication and authorization system uh, for EGI. Uh, we also provide training, uh, FITSM training, which is a lightweight uh, IT service management uh, system, uh, ISO 27K for information security, and also a subset of the infrastructure is devoted to training activities as well. And on top of all of this, uh, we also offer applications that notebook and replay. Notebooks is the Jupyter notebook technology. Replay is a name for binder technology. But those are, uh, um, uh, I'm sure you are familiar with those. And then uh, here are links. We'll share the presentation, of course, after the, the recording. Um, uh, but then you have links to the service catalog uh, on the EGI website and also the documentation uh, for users. So who do we serve? Um, we, we serve primarily the research sector, uh, research communities and research infrastructure, international research projects and uh, collaboration. And uh, those are the primary targets. Then we also serve a small international groups and individual researchers. But for those, we basically connect them to uh, nodes in the federation. And EGI is not as heavily involved as we are with the big communities. Um, we also serve the private sector, um, uh, SMEs, industry in general, the goal here being the uh, exchange of knowledge between academia and industry uh, to get the best of both worlds. And we also collaborate with public authorities and policymakers. Uh, with public authorities, this is just to uh, remove borders, uh, for example, in Europe, to uh, uh, enable uh, policy making across the continent. And uh, in policymakers, we offer the expertise, our vision of the, where the technology is going. So we kind of uh, provide the state of the art information uh, to help shape um, uh, funding programs, for example. Then how do we offer the capacity to scientific community? So we normally are, we are normally approached by a representative of the scientific community. They come to EGI with a list of requirements. Uh, then we share the requirements with the uh, federation members. And then they reply back to EGI saying what's possible, what are the conditions. And then we do the matchmaking. This may be refinement of uh, a refinement of the, of the requirements, or maybe we need to tweak here and there. Uh, in the end, all going well. 
uh, we reach an agreement and uh, EGI um, signs and, and service level agreement with the scientific community and uh, an operational level agreement with each of one per uh, provider. And this is all to say uh, the, the amount of resources that we are going to commit for this uh, uh, scientific community, the amount of resources and also the amount of time and also the service level targets, like uh, what uptime do you expect and uh, um, and these kind of things. Uh, and just to make sure that everybody's happy, uh, we perform also regular satisfaction interviews with the scientific community and also we deliver uh, performance reports uh, to the to the providers. I'm going to give you three examples of communities that are kind of the role model uh, in EGI, uh, what we aim for, and this is Winemar, which is a worldwide infrastructure for nuclear magnetic resonance and structural biology. And what they want to understand is life at molecular level uh, to to uh, develop uh, better molecules or materials health of or food applications and you see uh, on the right side a map with the usage uh, the users are spread across the world and uh, for example the haddock uh, web portal is being used by more than 32,000 uh, users uh, across 137 countries uh, here we also see the number of users has been increasing since uh, 2016 uh, and is currently more than 35k users, more than 500k jobs. And there was even with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there was even a special request to offer more resources because this community was especially uh, understanding the molecular uh, mechanism uh, for, for the COVID pandemic. So um, that was a, that, there, there you see the, the peak here in, in, in the, um, in the number of jobs that have been processed, for example. Uh, to this community, EGI provides uh, check-in, cloud compute, online storage, workload manager, HTC compute, and CBMFS. This is to distribute software packages uh, globally. And there are links to, to news items where you get more information. The second example is the European Multidisciplinary Seafloor and Water Column Observatory, or EMSO for short. Uh, but they, they have a network of observatories spread across Europe, and these are observatories with water column sensors and seafloor sensors, and the goal basically is to mm, monitor in real time uh, live underwater. Um, so they they have different data sources spread across all the observatories. Uh, they they publish this data in well known repositories. But as they approached EGI to build a data management platform where all the data could be uploaded and, and could be consulted with uh, correct APIs to uh, offer uh, scientists uh, dashboards, data portals, um, uh, data analytics, etc. cetera. Uh, for example, for EMSO, you see that SESGA uh, in Spain and INFN in Italy offer this amount of resources uh, at the bottom. And this is an example of what the SLA or the service level agreement looks like um, uh, between EGI and EMSO. Uh, you see that uh, we list here SESGA and INFN, and then we say the amount of resources and the duration of the of the uh, resource provisioning, et cetera. Also the support that's expected with this delivery uh, and so on. And this is an example of uh, how it looks at, like for the internal staff for EI. So on the uh, top left, you see the service registry. This is where all service providers are registered. Um, this is used, for example, by the monitoring dashboard, because the monitoring dashboard is going to um, uh, probe every endpoint in the, in the database uh, regularly to monitor if, if the endpoint is alive or is dead, and, and we get that information from the health of the services and the providers. Uh, at the bottom right, you see the accounting portal, and this is gathering usage across all communities, across all the federation. And uh, that's why you see this huge, uh, huge uh, slope over there. Um, and then on the, on the bottom left, uh, there is an example of a service performance report, and this is what we delivered to the scientific community as well. And we say here, in the last period, 
it is an example of of the health of the service uh, for that period. So you can get an idea of how well it behaves. Sometimes when things are going wrong, we also can discuss changing providers. That's not normally the case, but sometimes it happens. Um, and, and then in, in, we, we deliver these reports, we meet with the community and we say, what is going well, what is going bad, what can we improve and, and collect suggestions for improvement. And the last example is INES. Uh, this is the European Network for Air Science uh, Modeling. And they deliver uh, a, a data science environment for climate data analysis. Um, I think it's a good example for this talk, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, climate informatics uh, reproducibility challenge. They, they use uh, legacy infrastructure, the data in legacy infrastructure from uh, ESGF. Uh, they have developed uh, a SINDA, which is a, a data collector and caching services to put the data closer to the compute where they de deploy Jupyter Hub to provide uh, environments, custom environments for users. Um, again, you have here a link uh, to know more about Ines and also the list of services provided by EI. This is check-in for uh, authentication, cloud compute, notebooks, online storage, and, and data hub, and the amount of resources uh, in this SLA for them. Also, the list of um, resource providers. Cyphernet is from, from Poland, Tubitak is from Turkey, Cessnet is from the Czech Republic, and GRNet is from Greece. So now I move to the second part of the talk, and this is to present the connection between uh, EGI and, and the European Open Science Cloud, and we call it EOSC for short. So first, uh, for those that may not be aware of uh, what it is, uh, the European Open Science Cloud is aims at becoming an environment for hosting and processing research data to support European science. And it, the correct word here is aims because it's, it's the goal, uh, but it's not there yet. It's being developed as we speak. So it's under construction. So don't expect to have a, this system up and running and fully operational now. Uh, it's it's being built as we speak. Uh, the main goal is to have this federated environment with multidisciplinary uh, research uh, where everybody can find data, reuse data, reanalyze data, reuse tools and services across Europe for research, innovation, education, etc. Uh, well, then what? Uh, how, how is it built? So instead of thinking of the EOSC as a single cloud provider, uh, you need to think of EOSC as, uh, as a, a building on top of what's existing around Europe already, uh, which is maybe supported by the European Commission, member states with national funding, research community with their own funding. They all come together, uh, they federate together, and they offer this together because we think it's the, the together is stronger than the individual parts. So uh, this is this is the aim. And specifically, uh, what what is EGI contributing to EOSC? Well, as I mentioned, uh, EGI has been more, for more than a decade federating uh, providers, service providers, technology providers. So we we know we've been in the business for for a, for a, for some time now, and this is the expertise that we can share with with EOSC. And actually, it's one of the, the the computing platform that I presented before is one of the elements that it's implementing EOSC already. So it's part of EOSC now. Uh, but on top of that, uh, EGI is also coordinating the EOSC service portfolio, the, pro the onboarding process for services uh, providers that want to join. So if, if you or your institution have services or um, infrastructure that you think may, may become part of EOSC, you can approach also EGI. Uh, we can discuss how to help you be part of EOSC. And uh, finally, also dedicated user support action. This is basically helping users to uh, make them aware about EOSC and also how to use EOS uh, effectively. Uh, there is a marketplace for, for the European Open Science Cloud. And here I paste a link to the services that EGI has uh, is offering through uh, the EOS marketplace. You can, you can get a look uh, afterwards. So now there is this question, how does EEI and EOSC support reproducible open science? So this is one uh, model story that we share is uh, we offer the notebooks and data hub. You can upload your data to data hub and then can use that from the notebooks. And then the notebooks, you, you can have your 
custom environments where you develop your software to analyze the data. Then once you are happy, you can share your software uh, via GitHub, publish it, make a release, uh, make us another record and you get your DOI. And then you can share that and uh, make this available to others so they can go to, again, notebooks or binder and take the code from GitHub and the data from GitHub and reproduce your analysis. This is one way of, of supporting reproducible open science, open science. Okay, so now to the third and final part of the talk, uh, which is where I also show a little demo. Um, I'm gonna explain the collaboration between EGI and, and, and the uh, Pangeo community in Europe. Um, so EGI has been involved in the EGI ACE project, and this was about um, offering this capacity from the EGI Federation to research uh, in Europe uh, mainly. Uh, so we had this open call for use cases where people could apply for resources. And that was the case for the Pangeo community. They submitted a proposal and we analyzed the proposal. We liked it. And uh, then we started negotiations with, with the community. So uh, going back to the previous slide, this is like the Pangeo community came to EI. We discussed their requirements, uh, discussed this with the providers. And we got we got we, we agreed on a service level agreement and operational level agreement. Um, then in practice, this is EIAs with Pangeo community in Europe and with Cessnet. Uh, this is the uh, infrastructure provider, the cloud provider uh, in the Czech Republic. Also, we involved uh, a technology provider in EGI, which is the infrastructure manager. This is uh, developed is a software a system developed by uh, Greek App in in Valencia, in Spain. Um, and this is what we used, uh, part of what we used to deploy uh, the Pangeo uh, stack uh, on top of uh, the EGI cloud. I'm gonna give you a, a, a very short uh, explanation of what uh, Infrastructure Manager does. Uh, all the information, the, the, the software is open source, it's all, all available on GitHub. And I'm also linking here um, uh, a talk that they gave, a webinar, um, and you can find more details with the slides and a uh, YouTube recording. So everything is there and everything is open source. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, what you do is uh, you provide uh, infrastructure manager with a description of the infrastructure that you want. And this can be as simple as a virtual machine or can be a cluster of virtual machines. And you provide that description in the form of a Tosca template, which is a standard to define this virtual infrastructure. So you say, OK, create me this infrastructure. And then on top of that, uh, you can also configure uh, Ansible roles to configure the virtual machines. And on top of that, you can deploy whatever you want. So in the context of uh, the Pangeo community, uh, what we did is we, we deployed a, a, a cluster of virtual machines. And then on top of that, we deployed Kubernetes. And on top of that, we deployed the Helm chart with uh, Dask Hub, which is combining Jupyter Hub and Dask Gateway. Um, and I have here an example of how it works all together. So you go to Infrastructure Manager, looks like this. You need to have an EGI account. Then the Tosca templates are predefined for you here. So you don't have to build it from scratch. So you can say, build me a Kubernetes cluster or a Slurm cluster, or a simple virtual machine, for example, or a virtual machine with Docker is pre-installed and it does it for you automatically. You just need to click and wait. Uh, and you have many more uh, templates uh, down there, but basically. So for this example, we take uh, the Kubernetes example. And then inside Kubernetes, we select Dask. We say next. And then here we say, okay, give it this name. This is the size of the cluster, the amount of cores, then Kubernetes is tail. Uh, Dask details, uh, how I can configure the cluster. And then finally you go and select the cloud provider that you want to deploy it in on. So for example, I'm using Cessnet and then Cessnet is gonna give me uh, here, for example, a list of um, virtual machine images and that they are going to be the base image for the virtual machines. On top of that, I deploy the rest. And here you see on the, on the right uh, that 
infrastructure manager also is going to give me information about how busy is the cloud at the moment. So you see if you have a space to deploy uh, what you are asking for. And basically, you just click go and just need, need to wait a little bit. And it's going to start the deployment automatically for you. Uh, and then everything going well, uh, which it doesn't, nor, uh, usually you, you may find problems as well. Everything is configured. You get the outputs. And then in the outputs, for example, here, it de because we deployed Kubernetes, it deploys the Kubernetes dashboard automatically because this is a shared cluster, um, test cluster. I'm sharing here the connection details, but this is something that you need to be careful with. So you get access to the Kubernetes dashboard, and then you see, okay, this is the deployment, all is green, all is good. So I go to the Jupyter Hub endpoint, and there you are. It's just clicking here, you get access to the to the uh, infrastructure. Uh, sorry, I think I need to. I'm exactly. So that that was the the, the demo for for infrastructure manager and the deployment that we did with um, the, with Pangeo. Uh, and then in 2022, uh, we offered this uh, to support three events, uh, FOS4G, Clibar, and eScience. And all the details are, of course, uh, published in this uh, repository uh, for everybody. They can have a look. The, there is a collection of um, notebooks and instructions on how to uh, repeat the experiments. So everything is, is uh, available for everybody. Uh, then... Well, after all of these activities in EGIAs, um, there was this C-Scale project, which EGI is also participating. Uh, the key differentiator between EGIAs and C-Scale is that C-Scale is, is centered around um, uh, Copernicus data. So in this project, uh, we get together with data providers, uh, Copernicus data providers, and the aim of the project was to develop something that wasn't there before, uh, um, which is putting a single place where you can search and find uh, Copernicus data from a single location in, in the members of, of CSK. Uh, uh, so basically each provider defines what data they have and they share it. And then there is a portal where you can find uh, uh, this data. This is all under development. So it's, it's again, it's um, a beta, uh, but it's a, it's a nice example of, again, getting together to put uh, things together and making it easier for uh, researchers. Uh, okay, so uh, Cscale had also an open call, uh, like like EGIA. So we this time we invited uh, the Pangeo community to apply for a use case uh, in Cscale because we saw that uh, there might be synergies here and and with the Copernicus offering, uh, this was a good example of again how to how to promote this. Uh, so. More, mostly it's a similar people with but with different hats we again we came together um and then started working on 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 this so and we get to the uh, reproducibility challenge today uh where we are offering c scale resources uh, to host the reproducibility challenge today uh, i'm sure you have the link so i'll skip this uh this is again a sh very short summary uh on how to get access to the resources for this uh, reproducibility workshop uh, the, you have the link with all the details, but basically you get access to a Jupyter Hub deployment. Well, this is uh, as well Dask Hub, so there is Dask Gateway uh, behind it for for the Pangeo notebook. Uh, and then uh, what you get is different flavors uh, automatically um, provisioned for you, uh, which is the Pangeo stack, uh, Pangeo with uh, GPU configurations, or uh, Python, R, and Julia standards for data science. Uh, on top of that, we also offer cloud storage uh, with MinIO, uh, and, and both services are behind EGI checking. So you need to get an EGI account, you need to apply uh, for access to the uh, Pangeo virtual organization, and once you get access, you'll be able to uh, use those services. And a summary of what's behind it uh, for you. Uh, for the duration of the reproducibility challenge, uh, every user gets uh, eight CPUs, uh, 16 gig of RAM, and 10 uh, gigabytes of uh, home folder. And this is for everybody in the reproducibility challenge per user. Then we have a shared space with 10 terabytes uh, via MinIO that you can also use for storing your data. Uh, there are GPUs available, 
but because they are shared in a cluster, uh, this is an opportunistic access. You you request the access to the GPU, in, and depending on the load, you may get access to one or the other. So uh, this is how it works uh, for this uh, deployment. And uh, also, every user is able to deploy their own uh, Dask cluster, and the current quota is four workers with uh, six uh, CPUs and four gigabytes of RAM each. I think a good way to convey support if you need my help or our help is basically open an issue in the repository that's available for the repo and we'll try to help you. And uh, so I'd like to uh, just take one more minute to compare the deployments uh, between EGIAs and CSCale. With EGIAs, we use Infrastructure Manager. This is deploying virtual machines on top of OpenStack and then Kubernetes and then uh, the Dask Hub. And then for object storage, we used OpenStack Swift. But then uh, for CScale, we tried out a different a different deployment. This is this time is using a bare metal Kubernetes cluster, uh, which is managed by, by Cessnet. So uh, the pros and cons is that uh, with the infrastructure manager and the virtual deployment, uh, basically you have more or less complete freedom to do whatever you want in the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and that gives you flexibility, but it's also virtualized. So it allows for a little bit less of performance. With the deployment uh, in CScale, this is a bare metal installation. So we need to be careful with security because it's a shared cluster, but it also gives you more performance compared to the to the virtualized one. Um, then for object storage, we have offered MinIO, as I mentioned, and the advantage is that via CScale, we can also explore what Copernicus data is available uh, for for you, and finally, everything it's work in progress, but we are documenting all the steps in this repository, which is also open source. Look, uh, uh, the main the main issue is that this is mo a moving target. We are learning as we go, and uh, we are planning to uh, up update all the documentations. At the moment, we have only draft pull requests, but we are uh, fine tuning those as we learn. And the goal is to uh, basically uh, dump there all the information that we use to deploy uh, the infrastructure on both cases, EGIAs and, and CSK. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening.